we are doing a four-part series on unity, building unity together and then rebuilding unity when it's lost. And we are on part three this morning. This morning we're going to talk about a key qualification for our unity and then a key character quality that is needed for our unity. Before we start, though, will you pray with me? Let's ask God for help as we look at his word this morning. Heavenly Father, this is what we want um, as we draw near to you. We, we want help. Lord, we are just not confident that we have what it takes to um, align all of our affections and thoughts and desires and attitudes in your direction under your word. And so we need you by your spirit to come and help us, um, to humble us so that we might be teachable, to make us approachable and Lord, I pray that you would draw near to each one of us and, and meet our needs that are so individually um, designed by you. Lord, where encouragement is needed because um, we're fearful, we're doing the right thing, but we need to, we're a little fearful. Lord, would you bring courage, encourage those this morning. And Lord, where there needs to be a, a gentle but clear warning, Lord, I pray that you would bring that to our hearts. Most of all, Lord, I pray that you would just build us up with your word. It is capable of, of doing its powerful work in us as we yield ourselves under it. And so, Lord, would you please give us just that humble posture underneath your word this morning and speak to us all that you want regarding unity and conflict and what your heart is towards it. And we ask it in your son's precious name. Amen. The, that's right. Amen. Uh, the impetus for our study on unity, uh, from my perspective, is, is unity on ministry teams, right? Um, from my vantage point, I, I'm really particularly interested in church planting teams that Finisterre may help other churches send to Papua New Guinea. Uh, those teams need great help in being unified together on the other side of the world where it's very difficult to live. Um, I can tell you from experience and any of our teams that have been over on that side of the world would tell you that the greater threat to any church planting team sent to the Pacific Rim is not a 7.6 um, earthquake that destroys missionary homes. It's just not the, most, uh, the greater threat. But rather the greater threat to every church planting team, no matter where they are sent in the world, is their inability to build unity and or rebuild it when it's lost. Nothing will neutralize a gospel preaching team faster than that. How, how do you preach reconciliation to a tribe when two Christian missionaries can't or won't reconcile with one another? In my favorite um, missionary biography on, on William Carey, there's this sobering quote, quote towards the end. Listen to this. The greatest trial of a missionary is often another missionary. And it's true. It's just true. It's true here at home. You don't have to go to the other side of the world to figure that out. Um, the greatest trial of a Christian is, is most of the time another Christian. <laughs> Isn't that sobering? And I'm grateful for the opportunity just to bring the study on unity here into the church. Um, there's widespread application. Let's, let's take our Bibles as we get ready for part three this morning and turn to Proverbs chapter six, verse 16. Proverbs six, verse 16. It's a familiar passage. It's often referred to as the seven deadly sins. Although that's not really, I think, where the seven deadly sins originated. Proverbs 6, verse 16, here's what Solomon says. There are six things which Yahweh hates, even seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked thoughts, feet that hasten to run uh, to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and number seven, one who spreads strife among brothers. That number formula, there are six, dot, 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 even seven, that's actually a Hebrew literary form which alerts the reader to the significance of the second number, the number seven. The seventh item in the paragraph is the focal point. 
And the six prior sins before it are driving towards that seventh sin, which is in particular focus. God hates these sins. He hates all sins. They are morally repulsive to him. They are an abomination to him. They are utterly outrageous in his sight. And his exclamation point on what he hates in this paragraph is one who spreads strife among brothers. So so just marinate in that for for just a, a moment. Strife and or discord actually being created being given room to grow among God's people, that actually turns his stomach because he loves our unity. He loves our fellowship. He loves your love for one another. He loves your peace that you have with one another. And he loves it when you make peace with each other. And if this is how God truly feels about our unity, that he loves it so, and this is how he truly feels about conflict and strife being stirred up, that it's morally outrageous to him. Does that mean we're supposed to build and rebuild unity without any qualifications on it? Are we to build unity for unity's sake, regardless of what kind of unity it is? Well, you know the answer to that, and that leads us to our first point this morning. Number one, a key qualification for team unity. And you see a lot of passages up there. We'll walk through many of them. Let's talk about a key qualification or condition for our team unity. We've been a church long enough, and we've done church together long enough. We've studied our Bibles long enough together to know that there are actually biblical grounds for separating from one another in particular circumstances, aren't there? Let's look at some of those key New Testament passages to remind us of this important fact that God's high call for unity with one another, it's not a unity for unity's sake call. And it's not a unity at all costs unity. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18 first. We're going to look at some very familiar passages that we've been in before, but turn to Matthew chapter 18. These are not deep dives into each of these passages. They're just a refresher reminder. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Now, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. That's the goal. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as the Gentile and the tax collector. Do you know where separation and division occurs and where it does not occur in that passage? Separation or division is not in verse 15. If your brother sins, separate from him. It's not there. And it's also not in verse 16. If he does not listen to you and the two or three witnesses, separate from him. That's not where the separation is. It's found in verse 17. If he even refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as the Gentile and the tax collector. Now remember, Jesus himself is the one who predicted that he would unify his sheep under his one shepherding rule. He prayed in John 17 that they would all be one. He bled and died to form this previously unseen new unity called the church. Uh, That's Ephesians 2, and he is the one building his church. That's Matthew 16. And now we find that he is also the one revealing to us that our unity can't just be any old kind of unity. Our unity together has to be marked by obedience to his commands and an approachableness. We have to be correctable by one another. A humble willingness to listen to what our brother is trying to tell us from his corrective love. That's an important qualification to make and embrace regarding unity. A ministry team's unity has to be everything that Christ wants it to be, and it has to include this. So let me ask you a question. Are you a good listener? Because that's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to listen. Are you a good listener to the imperfect ministry partner who's trying to tell you what he sees from his non-omniscient point of view? Can you listen to that? 
Are you patient as he may be still trying to zero in on what the concern is that he has in your life? Can you even help him? This bumbling, can't get it right the first time ministry partner, can you help him get it out accurately so you can listen to it accurately? Have you ever said to the one correcting you that God has brought to you, can I I say back to you what your concern is so that you can tell me if I have your point accurately? See, that would prove that you're listening. I want to be able to hear what you're saying. Let's put it on the other side. Somebody's coming to you, uh, or you're, you're the one going to them. Are you a patient corrector? Can you humbly try to get into your ministry partner's shoes as they listen to you trying to bring your concern? Have you ever strategized before you've gone needing to do, have that difficult conversation? Have you ever strategized and thought, how can I disarm my brother, my sister? How can I be as winsome as possible? And when you hear them and watch them receive what they're hearing from you, Have you ever said, what do you hear when I articulate this concern to you? What is it you're hearing? Because I want to be able to narrow down what I am saying and what I am not saying. Can you accept the the fact that you may need to actually clarify what you're bringing to your ministry partner? That you might need to qualify it, that you actually might need to correct your correction you're bringing to them. The reason we do that is so our ministry partner can listen well, successfully listen to us. Separation in fellowship occurs in Matthew 18 here when one refuses to listen. So ministry teams, marriages, parenting relationships, all of them need to help the listening process go as well as it possibly can, not complicate it. Let's turn to Romans chapter 16. Let's look at another passage. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Now I urge you, brothers, to keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and stumblings contrary to the teaching which you have learned, and turn away from them. Because such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own stomach, and by their smooth and flattering speech they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Within the church's fellowship, from time to time, there's going to be those who cause dissensions that show up and stumblings contrary to the standard of teaching from the Bible. And we are not called in the name of unity to find some way to tolerate them. Do you understand that? We are called to actually keep our eye on them and turn away from them. Where are they? They're over there. Turn away from them. Where are they now? Keep your eye on them and turn away from them. You see, there's to be a separation that takes place there. The unity that we have with each other in Christ as ministry teams, it's not just any old kind of unity for unity's sake. It is a Bible-loving unity. It is a truth-concerned unity. It is a Scripture-standardized unity. And if someone assaults that truth in our presence, we don't look for a way to be inclusive. We turn away from them. Listen, a a believer doesn't wake up one day and just find himself causing dissensions and stumblings contrary to the teaching of the Bible. Where does this start in a heart? Where can it start? A a place to watch might be an unchecked desire to, to just be a contrarian. You ever seen that in your heart? You know, when the conversation doesn't really need a criticism, but you've got one in your mind and you share it anyway. It doesn't need a dissenting theoretical possibility that exists out there injected into it, but there's some level of pleasure and satisfaction of being that guy or that girl. That that would be a hard attitude that would just need careful scrutinizing because it could grow in unsuspecting ways that one day could actually pull apart a ministry team. Let's go to a few pages to the right. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 13. We won't read that whole section, but if you'll remember, this is the account about a sexually immoral brother in the church that the church did not deal with biblically in Corinth. 
And Paul says this sexually immoral so-called brother should have been, verse 2, removed from your midst. There's separation. Drop down to verse 9, chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Look at verse 11. Now I am writing to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a sexually immoral person or greedy or even an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. That's a pretty severe separation. Verse 13, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Paul says this sexually immoral so-called brother should have been removed. And the Corinthian church chose a kind of unity that neglected obedience or faithfulness to God. And they're not commended for this by Paul. They, They chose a unity that found a way to be inclusive of a lifestyle they should have never allowed in their midst. It was a direct contradiction to God's word. So again, Jesus does not call us to any old kind of unity out there. There are sadly times when we must separate from so-called brothers because our unity is contingent upon scripture, our obedience to it, and our approachability. So are you watching over your own life carefully? Are you watching over it closely? In Corinth and in any church, this is possible. It is possible to profess faith in Christ, to be a so-called brother, be in the church, be in gross sin at the same time. That's really sobering. Team unity is not required to accommodate every kind of lifestyle. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who walks in an unruly manner and not according to the tradition which they receive from us. There's the word of God being brought into it again. When do you keep away from a brother? When do you withhold yourself from a brother? Is it when he doesn't agree with you the first time? Is it when he is offended by your approach because your meeting didn't go so well? No. Rather, it's when he walks when he lives in a pattern of unruly living. He doesn't want to be constrained by New Testament rules for his living. And look, this is so helpful. Look over at verse 14. If anyone does not obey our word in this letter, take special note of that person to not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. And yet, right here, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. That is so helpful That's our attitude and our disposition towards the one that we actually are separated from. That requires a great deal of spiritual maturity, especially if you have been one who experienced direct offenses from his unruly life. The offense of that can quickly tempt you to take a stance against him that you would towards an enemy, and God doesn't want that. Let's look at another one. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1-5. to 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. There's a really long, ugly list of what men will be like in the church later in the last days. Look how verse 5 ends. Keep away from such men as these. Again, Christ's love for unity, his call for you to build unity and rebuild it when it's lost does not expect you to do it without any qualification on it. And then lastly, let's go to Titus chapter 3, verse 10. Titus chapter 3, verse 10. Reject a factious man, somebody who's spreading, separating the people in the church. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning. What do you know if he doesn't listen to you after the second warning? Well, here's what you know, knowing that such a man is perverted. And you know that that man is sinning. And you know that he is self-condemned. He's not condemned by you. He condemns himself by not listening. So I hope you can see by now that Christ's love for unity is not a call for unity at all costs. That would actually be a meaningless unity, wouldn't it? If someone is trying to divide us, what kind of unity is it if we, in the name of unity, allow him to keep dividing us? It doesn't even make any sense. 
God's word and our responsiveness to his word and to each other, those things govern the quality of our team unity. They set the condition for our team unity. But I want you to see one more breakup of a team, of team unity, that is very different from the rest. That's why Acts 15 is separated from the rest of the list. Okay, let's turn to Acts chapter 15. I want you to actually go to chapter 13 first so we can see the formation of this amazing church planting team. What you're doing as you turn to Acts chapter 13 is you're actually turning um, to the New Testament's church planting manual. That's what you're doing. This is the New Testament um, church planting manual, the book of Acts. And let's watch this first church planting team be used by God in an absolutely amazing way for Christ's glory on one missionary journey and then disintegrate before they can take a second one. In chapter 13, verse 1, this is in Antioch of Syria. This is an amazing church that's starting to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. They send out Paul and Barnabas. I want you to notice first in verse 2 that this is a team made by heaven. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me. This is the Spirit saying, I want these two, Barnabas and Saul. I have work that must be done, and it's for them, and I want them for me to do this work that I have for them. So this is a team, a church planting team made in heaven. And we find by verse um, 5 that they have a third team member added. His name is Mark, or John, John Mark. And there's your church planting ministry team. What do we know about these three people so far in the New Testament? Barnabas has only ever been portrayed by Luke as a faithful, dependable believer with a fruitful life and a fruitful ministry. Paul, I mean, come on, it's the Apostle Paul since chapter 9. Uh, same thing with his life, a fruitful life. John Mark, uh, he's an unknown commodity to us, and something happened on the Mark side of the team equation. Look at chapter 13, verse 13. After Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left the team, and he didn't return to Antioch. He didn't want to deal with Antioch. He went all the way back to his home, which is Jerusalem. The first church planting team experiences its first fracture. And this happens this side of heaven, doesn't it? Now, fast forward a few years to, or a couple years to Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Now, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Let's go back. This is now Paul's second missionary journey that's about to launch. And evidently, Mark, John Mark, has come back into the picture in Antioch and Barnabas kept wanting to take Mark along. And that's the idea in the verb tense there. Barnabas kept wanting to take John, called Mark, along with them also. Well, what about Paul? For every expression of Barnabas's wanting Mark, Paul kept insisting, verse 38, Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along. Paul's pieces of the pie from what had happened back in Acts chapter 13 was that Mark, in verse 38, deserted them. And he had not gone with them to the work. So he didn't want anything to do with Paul and Barnabas, and he didn't want anything to do with the work that the Holy Spirit called them to do. Uh, called them to work at. And there is the disagreement. Barnabas saw a way and kept making a case for Mark to come and that he should be involved. And Paul could not think of a way that he would go with Mark anywhere. Now remember, our unity is conditioned upon Scripture's authoritative presence in our midst and our obedience under it, our teachableness, our approachableness. And Barnabas has only ever been presented as a faithful dude in the, in the book of Acts. And Paul, the same. There's no evidence to the contrary anywhere. So what then is the outcome of this disagreement? Verse 39, there was such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. So Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and left being committed by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And Luke is always so careful in the book of Acts and also in his gospel. He's precise in what he includes and he's precise in what he leaves out. 
there's nothing here about the church in Antioch starting to initiate church discipline procedures against either man. God's word is not under attack by Barnabas. It's not under attack by Paul. Barnabas was not living a rogue, unruly, unaccountable life. Neither was Paul. But these two godly church planting team members, these two men could not keep their disagreement from becoming sharp. And so they separated from each other. And two church planting teams went forth. And everybody who reads this is left scratching their head. Wow. How did that happen? And what point should we learn from this about church planting teams and unity? Listen, here's all you can do. Labor hard to build unity for your ministry team. Set scripture up high as your standard for ministry and for living. Align your life in obedience under the word of God. Be humble, be approachable, be correctable by your teammate. Rebuild unity wherever it has been lost. Love unity. Guard it from factious, divisive people coming into your team. Do everything you can toward these Christ-honoring goals. And then recognize... Sometimes, under the sun, this side of heaven, where residual depravity still lingers on in us, even the best men, even the best men, sometimes can't hold themselves together. And it may not be due to a case of unrepentant sin or even unteachableness, but some disagreement over personnel on a team, for whatever reasons that that can't lose its sharp edge, and so it cuts the team apart. And that is sobering, and we scratch our heads when we see that. Can, can I tell you a couple of encouraging things, though, in this, about this account? Here's what's encouraging to me, that the Holy Spirit actually included an account like this in his church planting manual. Because it's real. It's descriptive of what happened. It's not a command to go do it. Do you understand? It's not a command to go do it, but it's descriptive of what happened. And he didn't tell us every detail. We're actually left with gaps of knowledge, aren't we? And that's actually very real to when stuff like this happens. We have gaps of knowledge and we're left just scratching our head. What on earth? Well, you know what else is encouraging? What comes after chapter 15, verse 41? Look down. What comes after chapter 15, verse 41? Chapter 16, verse 1. Get this. Here's how the book of Acts, the book of Acts doesn't end at 1541. The book of Acts doesn't end and say, well, and the great church planting experiment of the gospel came to a tragic end because good men could not work their way through their disagreement. It doesn't end there. You know what that means? The mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ in church planting to the ends of the earth, it's not dependent on Paul, and it's not dependent on Barnabas, and it's not dependent on their savvy and their ability to create unity together. The gospel mission in church planting to the ends of the earth is dependent upon Jesus Christ, even though we sometimes muck it up. The mission of the gospel belongs to Jesus. That's good news. And he is building his church, and it depends entirely upon him. He overcame this head-scratching team division between these two great men. And one other thing is encouraging. This head-scratching, church-planting team dynamic, you know what else is encouraging? It doesn't occur in every chapter. Wouldn't that be a bummer if you had to read that every chapter over and over? God put it in once. I'm glad it's there, and I'm glad it's not in every chapter. So again, Acts 15 is descriptive of what happened, and that means it is illustrative of what can happen and still does happen. And it's not here to be in an endorsement of every ministry team's disintegration. Well, we couldn't get along. Well, you know, Paul and Barnabas, so we're okay. No, it's not an endorsement for that. It's not there to be a justification for every ministry team's unraveling on the field. It's just helpful that it's there, this side of heaven. It's an unfortunate component that sometimes occurs on the gospel mission and church planting goes on. 
That's a key qualification for team unity. We don't pursue just any old kind of unity. Scripture and living in alignment with it and being approachable, those are qualifications that are put on our unity and good men who love these qualifications sometimes still fall apart. And that leads us lastly to consider this morning, number two, the key quality for team unity. What is the key quality for team unity? I'm just gonna put it up there. You can see it at the top. It's humility. Humility. What is humility? Well, Romans 12, 3 helps describe it for us. It's not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. It's knowing I I have a tendency to do that. I need to bring myself down. Humility is described this way. It's not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also looking out for the interests of others. I just naturally look after my own personal interests. I I need to be humble and, and be aware that I do that and look out more for the interests of others. Humility is having the same heart of selflessness that John the Baptist had as Jesus' ministry was eclipsing his own. Jesus must increase and I must decrease. And when humility is thriving on a ministry team, unity has a chance. Unity has a chance. Let me give you some examples of how humility can impact you, how you can apply it in your own life. Let's go back to Psalm 39, verses 4 to 6. Psalm 39, verses 4 to 6. This is so interesting. Let's look at this humble man named David before God in prayer. I want you to think carefully about David's humble request in verse 4. Yahweh, cause me to know my end. Cause me to know what is the extent of my days. Let me know or make me know how transient I am. That's interesting. When do you make those kinds of requests to God? I'll tell you when. When you can't get yourself to that knowledge on your own. And you know it. It's the humble sense of, God, I should know my end. I should know the extent and the limited reach of my days, but I can't get there sufficiently on my own. Will you help me? Cause me to know where my limits lie. I should know how transient I am, and I'm struggling on my own to comprehend it sufficiently. Make me to know how transient I am. That's humility applied. That's just a humble self-assessment. David is not confident in what he thinks he knows even about himself. Have you applied humility? in that way toward yourself. What a blessing a team has and is when it has members with that kind of humility working together. Let's watch this humble man again. Go to Psalm 139, verse 23. This humble man is in action again in prayer. Verse 23, search me, O God. And God, know my heart. Try me, God. Know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. When or why do you ever ask God to search you? When do you ask him to know your own heart? When do you ask him to try you? And when do you ask him to know your anxious thoughts? It's when you're not satisfied that you can search yourself sufficiently. You ask him to do that when you are not confident that you know your own heart as you should. You ask him that when you know that there are just elements of your character that, and and your being that remain um, unrefined and untested yet. It's when you are suspicious that anxiety is somewhere and I need you to find it, God. It's lurking in the shadows of my heart. I know it's there, but I can't find it. When do you ask God to see if there is any hurtful way in you? It's when you are not sure yourself that you've been able to adequately answer that question yourself. Has humility been applied in that way toward yourself to that degree? What a blessing to every ministry team is that kind of a humble team member. I'm going to let you look at Proverbs 3 on your own. Let's skip over to Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Proverbs 14, verse 12. And I want you to have Proverbs 21, 2 also ready at the same time. 
And I don't know if anybody noticed this, but I think at any moment now, it's going to start snowing in here. Does it, do you feel that? I guess we skipped right fall and just went from summer to winter here at Grace Bible Church. That's not a complaint. It's an observation. 1412. Watch this. Here's what you and I do, and we may not even be aware that we even do it because humility may not yet have been sufficiently pushed into our own self-assessment yet. Watch this. 1412. There is a way which seems right to a man. That's what we do. We construct a way forward for us, for ministry, for our ministry team, for relationships that we are in. And as we look on that way from our own perspective, there's only one assessment that we can make about this great idea going forward. It seems right to me. Go to chapter 21, verse 2. Every man's way is right in his own eyes. Not some men do this, not even most men do this, but this is what every one of us is and does. We formulate a way forward, we formulate a path to walk, and we love it, and we need to see how these verses end. Go back to 14.12. There's a way which seems right to man, but its end is the way of what? Death. It seemed so right at the beginning, and now I'm so dead. That's a massive disconnect. Humility applied to our evaluation of our own ways says, I know I do this. I know I do this. Where should I be suspect about this way that I'm so confident in, that I'm sure is right? What am I missing that could actually be deadly? Who could and should help me assess this way of thinking? Look how 21.2 ends. But Yahweh weighs the heart. Seems so right at the beginning. Humility applied to our self-evaluation would say, oof, before I, I, I continue on in this way that seems so right to me, I've probably not evaluated my heart motives yet well enough. I need to turn to God in prayer. I need to turn to him one more time. I put my own heart in the scales and I only ever find them to to be right about the way that I'm plotting. I'm convinced about what I see. I I grant favor to myself, but my self-assessment has a history of gaps and holes. Have you applied humility toward yourself in this way? Do you want to? And man, what a blessing to team unity that kind of a team member will be. Let's turn to Proverbs 28, verse 26. Proverbs 28, verse 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will escape. Humility applied to our view of ourselves will actually eagerly admit this truth that when I trust in my own heart, I'm a fool. Humility properly applied in conflict asks self all of the time, who who are you trusting right now? Am I being foolish in where I'm depositing my trust right now? I have a propensity to trust in my own heart. Is that happening in any way in this right now? And the implication from the last part of verse 26 is that there is actually a trap in trusting in your own heart that you can escape, but it's going to require you to walk more wisely. Can you imagine on a team? You got team member A trusting in his own heart, not even aware that he's doing it. And then you got team member B doing the exact same thing, both of them trusting in their own hearts. What happens when heart A is not in alignment with heart B? I don't think that should be our next step for the ministry team. I don't think that's what color the carpet should be. What happens? Oh my goodness. You have a self-inflicted team wound. And traps get set for each other from which it will be difficult to escape until those team members walk more wisely. Go back to Proverbs chapter 25, verse 8. This is so interesting and very humbling. Proverbs 25, verses 8 to 10. Listen, there is only one way that this proverb can be true for the you that it is directed to. I want you to see if you can get it. Do not go out hastily to plead your case. Lest what will you do in the end when your neighbor humiliates you? Plead your case with your neighbor and do not reveal the secret of another. 
lest he who hears it bring disgrace upon you and the bad report about you will not turn away. There's only one way this proverb can be true for the you in this passage. What is it? (laughs) It's if you are absolutely wrong about your side of the case with your neighbor and you don't know it. The picture being painted for us is this. You are absolutely convinced that you are in the right and your neighbor is in the wrong and you, uh, in this case that you have against him. So what you do is is you go out. You go out, verse 8, and you hastily plead your case in the courtroom of public opinion because you're convinced you're right. And you reveal the secret of another. You reveal the secret that's going on between you and your teammate. It's, It's what should have been privately dealt with between you and your neighbor. And Solomon says to that one who does that, who's unaware that he's even wrong, what are you going to do in the end when your neighbor humiliates you? The only way that your neighbor can humiliate you is if you were wrong in the first place, but you think you're right. Solomon says, when your neighbor hears what you've then gone and done in the court of public opinion, he will bring disgrace upon you and the bad report about you that you do this kind of foolish thing, it won't depart from you. It's interesting that Solomon only presents this one side, that you're wrong to begin with. You've assessed your neighbor and your case incorrectly, and it tells you how often wisdom sees this kind of thing happen among God's people. It tells you why wisdom is warning you. This happens far more than it should. Just go to him in private. Just plead your case with your neighbor. What if you're wrong? Then it just stays there between you two. And you can humbly admit it. Humility properly applied will cause you, listen, it'll cause you to slow down your lust for prosecution of your teammates based on your evidence, all that you believe you have, and it is right. Just humility will slow you down. Jesus taught something very similar. I think this is the same thought in mind. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. Matthew 5, 25. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last quadrants. What is the only way that this scenario can be true? If you are wrong, but you think you're right and you're on your way to court, and your opponent's walking down the, law, the, 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 the lane as well. And if that is true, that you think you're right, but you're actually wrong, you should be more suspicious of your case. You should be more suspicious of your confidence that you have in your case. And you should, right there on the road, make friends quickly with your opponent at law, right then and there. And the fact that Jesus only presents this one dimension tells you what he thinks about how often we think we're right, but we're actually wrong in our assessments. And this is what he wants to point out to his disciples because this is what we do far more than we should. Too often, there is no slowdown to reevaluate one more time if I may have gotten something wrong. Nope, I'm, nope we're not going to do that. I'm confident. Uh, there's no need to look over the evidence once again. This is a slam dunk case against my opponent. What do you say to that kind of disciple? You say what Jesus says. Make friends quickly with your opponent. Do it now. Do it now. And humility will admit that this is too often the way that I see things. That this is my default. This is what residual depravity in me does. It just defaults to this. It's my propensity. It's my inclination from my flesh. And what a, what a sweet teammate this kind of humbled believer is on a team. He's not eager to prosecute his teammate. Isn't that great? Wouldn't it be great to be a part of a team like that where a team member wasn't eager to prosecute you? He's not eager to go to conflict court. 
He reminds himself that he doesn't wear the robe and possess the gavel. He wants to keep the conflict contained just between him and his teammate. Now, he doesn't want to go out and try it in the court of public opinion. He doubts his own conclusions. He is eager to be proven wrong by even his teammate that he is in conflict with. He's eager to abandon his case if he's proven wrong. That's humility applied. Let's do one more. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5. You know these familiar verses. Why, Jesus says, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. How can you even do that? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, humility applied to your partnership with your brother on a ministry team will teach you to properly weigh not just your own sin, but properly weigh your teammate's sin. And hypocrisy in your heart will tilt the scales of assessment always in your own favor. Always. When humility is absent, we are so bothered by the small little fault, the small speck in the teammate's eye convinced that we have to act now on it. And humility applied will first just accept this. I am plagued with this propensity. I am plagued with this propensity to misdiagnose where the severity actually lies. So before I rush into my teammate's life, humility agonizes to see the proper proportions of sin and weakness that actually is present in my conflict, in my life and in my teammates. And unity has such a great chance to thrive when humility impacts a team like this. And by the way, do, do you guys realize this? You, you realize that the only kind of servant that God can bring to your life, you've, you've got an issue in your eye, you've got an issue in your life. The only kind of servant that God has to help you is one who's struggling to see his own issues. He's going to knock you around with a beam in his eye sometimes. If this was the wrong way to go about it, why did he leave us? It's his intent that he use this messy process. The only kind of person who can come to help you is one who is struggling to see his own sin proportionally and probably feels yours disproportionately. What are you going to do about it? You know what you need to do about it? What I need to do about it? Embrace it. This is his plan. Let's humble ourselves before him and agree with him. Let's walk this way together. Let's help each other. Take a step towards the guy with a beam in his eye who's trying to help you. Take a step towards him. Say, can I try to draw out of you what you're trying to touch in my life? Be patient. Be aware that you've got a beam and you're knocking him around as you're trying to help him. I'm so sorry that I'm, I'm just not getting this right. Wouldn't your team unity be so drastically different? Wouldn't your marriage be different? We can have scripture as our standard. And we can strive to live in obedience under scripture. And we can be convinced that we have a mutual obligation to hold one another accountable to it. We can have the qualification necessary, the condition necessary for unity. But if we are not humble before God, and if we are not humble toward each other, Unity is threatened, even though we have the right qualifications. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, the clarity of it. 
Thank you for the way that it um, shows us where humility is and what it looks like. It describes it for us. And Lord, we, we feel our need for your spirit. We feel our need for encouragement. We feel our need for uh, reproof. We, we feel our need for training and righteousness. Lord, would you please come and draw near to us as each one is in need and help us so that we can think rightly and live rightly before you in this unity that you've achieved for us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for predicting it, for telling us you would do it. Thank you for praying for it, that our unity would be like your unity with the Father and the Father's with you. With you. Thank you for suffering at the cross greatly and shedding your blood so that we might be made into this new man called the church that nobody ever saw before and we have unity with one another. We are members of one another. You didn't put any of this into our hands. You put all of it into your hands. There's only one set of fingerprints on this unity that we enjoy, that we stand on, and you did it. But now we put our fingertips and our fingerprints on practice of unity. We need to put scripture at the center of our unity and we need to put humility at the center of our unity. Would you please help us to put more fingerprints on those things, especially humility. Help us to walk humbly with one another. Work out your perfect will in each of our hearts as is needed. Lord, we love you and we're so grateful to be here together today with God's people. And I pray, Father, that even as the rest of us are all driving and pulling up and getting ready, Lord, that our hearts would be prepared by you to worship you with the praise that you deserve and are worthy of. Lord, bless our fellowship now as we talk and have time even before that service begins. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.